Thank you for the kind introduction. Uh, my name is Yoshida. I'm from uh, METI, Ministry of Economy, Trade, and Industry. I belong to uh, Trade Policy Bureau. And I'm very glad to uh, have this opportunity, especially I see many uh, familiar faces. Uh, Professor Urata, uh, Professor Armstrong, and EPEC uh, Secretary General uh, Rebecca. I'm very glad to join you uh, for this uh, symposium. Let me allow you the interpreter uh, so that I can speak Japanese. Now, thank you very much for giving me this opportunity to give the keynote address co-hosted by Riti and Australia National University titled An Asian Agenda for Securing the Multilateral Rules-Based Economic Order. Now, concerning today's speech, Based on the topic of this symposium, I've been talked to ask about uh, the international trade order, rule-based international trade order, mainly in Asia, and to talk about what Japan has been doing in terms of international collaboration, cooperation together with like-minded countries. So based on this, concerning the regional rules-based rules formation, I would like to mainly talk about what Japan uh, has been doing. and. We'd like to make this an opportunity to reconfirm the importance of rule-based open trade as uh, well as the possibility of cooperation between Japan, Australia, and ASEAN. Now, first, uh, let me talk about the current geopolitical situation uh, which will impact Japan, Australia, and the ASEAN. Now, recently, even in the world, within the Indo-Pacific area, a very detailed supply chain has been constructed. And within this, there is U.S.-China conflict and the COVID pandemic and uh, Russia's invasion in Ukraine. So based on that background, there has been much division within many areas in the political and uh, economy. And there are various risks that surface related to uh, the supply chain, and uh, various issues related to globalization have surfaced, especially the economy in this region, which is closely linked to China, is uh, prone to impact by the political conflict between U.S. and Japan. And Many of these the countries in these regions are impacted by uh, both the U.S. and China uh, political investment uh, constraints. And so how we deal with uh, economic efficiency and also uh, technological advantage, and also not only that, uh, the resilience and digital uh, revolution as well as their emission, we need to deal with these. And there is intensifying uh, competition within trade, investment, technology, and information. And as I mentioned, the international political situation, which has a major impact on this, the economies of this region, are becoming highly untransparent. Uh, for example, in the beginning of this month, in, in uh, Jakarta, Indonesia, the ASEAN summit meeting was held. At the East Asian summit, uh, concerning the heightening tensions between in Taiwan as well as in the South uh, China Sea, that was mentioned, discussed. But on the other hand, uh, neither President Biden nor Xi Jinping participated. So we are questioning how the ASEAN region is being positioned within the priorities of U.S. and China. Now, concerning the ASEAN member states as well, uh, there are various, various uh, different uh, moves. For example, in Myanmar, Laos, Cambodia, uh, their dependency on to China has been increasing, but on the other hand, because of the southern uh, China Sea issue, there is a report of friction between Vietnam and Philippines vis-a-vis uh, -vis China. So the centrality and unity of ASEAN, where decision-making is in principle done unanimously, how that can be done is now uh, subject of discussion. And when we think of the role of the global supply chain, the economic zone within the uh, Indo-Pacific 
uh, region, inclusive of ASEAN and Japan, Australia, the importance of that has been increasing. So within the political, unstable political economic situation within the world as well as in the Pacific, so how the trade order should be within this region where Japan, uh, Australia, and ASEAN belong to is now being tested. Now, before we talk about uh, the economic order in Asia, I would like to very briefly introduce to you about the discussions within G7, uh, where Japan served as the uh, presidency state this year. Next uh, month, October 28 through 29, within Sakai, Osaka, the G7 trade ministers meeting will be held, and at that time, with WTO reform, for the MC13, uh, which is the WTO ministerial meeting that will be held in February in Abu Dhabi, that will be the utmost priority issue to be discussed. So the emerging countries and developing countries' needs, which uh, is the focus of attention now is the Global South, based on that, how to maintain and develop the rule-based uh, international trade order uh, based on the WTO will be the point of discussion. So Japan and other G7 countries for the maintenance and strengthening of open fair trade uh, system regime as well as securing the economic security we need to strengthen uh, the global supply chain to make it more resilient and also we also need to strongly counter uh, the unilateral attempt to alter the status quo through economic coercion that is extremely important so maintaining the free trade regime and its uh, complementary responses, I would like to mention a few points on this. As I mentioned, concerning economic coercion, so in order to pressure foreign governments, economic measures are used, and we are seeing an in, uh, increase in such examples recently. So in order to respond effectively to this kind of economic coercion, not only one single country, uh, but like-minded countries need to cooperate. That is very important. For example, at the G7 Hiroshima summit meeting in May of this year, in order to counter economic coercion, uh, there was a concrete, very strong message that uh, cooperation will be done. And also in June, Japan, US, Canada, UK, Australia, New Zealand, uh, there was a six uh, of these six uh, countries. There has been a joint statement issued by the trade uh, ministers related to measures against economic coercion. And in the Hiroshima summit this May, amongst the reliable, trusted partner countries within G7, uh, the principles and resilient and reliable supply chains was newly announced. Uh, these are the principles that is indispensable to making the supply chain resilient. So transparency, diversity, safety, sustainability, and not only that, reliability is the indispensable uh, principle uh, in order to maintain and strengthen the supply chain network. This was newly added. So when we say reliability here, we mean that uh, abiding by international law and it is free and fair and reciprocal economic trade relations will be promoted. And to counter uh, various actions, as we can see in recent uh, examples in weaponizing economic dependence. So to all of these countries, the principles are resilient and reliable supply chains. We encourage all states to support this NSG7. We would like to support the uh, structuring resilience in 
the wide uh, international society, including uh, the developing countries. And this was discussed in the G7 process, and this will be brushed up in the G7 uh, trade ministerial meeting that will be held in uh, October. And we would like to input uh, to have maximum input on uh, the international cooperation for uh, Asian issues. Now, in light of the current international economic situations in which the G7 is currently discussing these issues, international economic cooperation with the like-minded countries will become increasingly important in the future. With this in mind, I would like to talk about Japan's effort to maintain and strengthen economic cooperations among the like-minded countries to strengthen the relationship with the global South region, which is emerging as a remarkable force in the world economy, and to maintain and strengthen the economic order in the region. First, I would like to talk about the Indo-Pacific Economic Framework, which was launched in May last year, in short, IPEF. The IPEF is a framework for discussing economic cooperations in the Indo-Pacific region, with a total of 14 countries participating, including the United States, Japan, Australia, and seven ASEAN countries. Meti Minister um, Mr. Nishimura attended the ministerial meeting in May this year. The meeting produced a joint press statement agreeing to accelerate negotiations toward an early agreement on the four pillars of trade, supply chain, clean economy, and fair economy, and announced concrete results for the first time, including the substantial conclusions of the IPEF supply chain agreement and the launch of the hydrogen initiative. The purpose of the supply chain agreement is to strengthen supply chains and improve the international competitiveness of industry in both peacetime and emergency situations with the like-minded countries. It is the first multilateral agreement to define specific procedures for cooperations in event of supply chain disruptions in a wide range of goods. Now, Japan has been working on the liberalizations of within ASEAN as well as taking the lead in free and open trade. CPTPP, which entered into force in 2018, and the RCEP, which will enter into force in 2022, are representative examples. Both are networks of FTAs and EPAs that include the ASEAN region, a huge economic zone. In the future, while pursuing the possibility of cooperations with the U.S., which is focusing on the IPEF as a part of its effort in the region, we believe that it is necessary to further promote cooperation and rulemaking aim at the higher level of content that matches the actual conditions in Asia and to further build economic relationship with Asia. Regarding the CPTPP, which is a comprehensive and progressive agreement on trans-Pacific partnership, the UK, which applied to join in February 2021, signed the protocol in July this year. Furthermore, China, Taiwan, Ecuador, Costa Rica, Uruguay, and Ukraine have requested to join the CPTPP agreement. And although the number of countries wishing to join the CPTPP is growing, discussions are centered on whether the high standards of the CPTPP can be met. As for RCEP, in which I was also involved in the negotiations as chief negotiator, although India decided not to join in the final stage of negotiation toward its launch, 15 countries, which account for about 30 percent of the world populations and GDP, signed the agreement in November 2020, and 
it is a huge economic zone that came into effect in January last year. In addition to being Japan's first free trade agreement with China and South Korea, the agreement is expected to function to enhance the e economic unity of the region by allowing products that are produced through the supply chain to be recognized as originating in the region. We expect that these framework will function to enhance the economic cohesion of the region. These frameworks have been supported by the networks of FTAs and ASEAN has promoted within, the, within and beyond the region. In terms of the contributions to the global south, especially to the ASEAN region, I would like to conclude by mentioning the recent activities of ASEAN Japan. This year marks the 50th anniversary of ASEAN Japan friendship and cooperation. In a market of combined 800 million people, we aim to co-create innovations and grow together for the next 50 years based on the trust we have built over the past 50 years. The final versions of the ASEAN Japan Economic Co-Creations Vision, which has been discussed with the experts, was announced at the ASEAN Japan Economic Ministers' Meeting last month. The four pillars of economic co-creation are achieving sustainability with diversity and inclusion, open innovation across borders, strengthening cyber and physical connectivity, and building an ecosystem for the co-creations of vibrant human capital. At the same time, the ASEAN Japan Future Design and Action Plan, which includes specific actions to be taken by the government of ASEAN and Japan to realize the vision, has been formulated. The plan calls for the development of a trade infrastructure utilizing digital technology, the establishment of a circular economy infrastructure, and concrete measures toward green economy. We are currently working on the formations of a proposal with the ASEAN countries to realize a specific co-creations proposals at the ASEAN Japan Economic Co-Creations Forum scheduled to be held in December of this year. In addition, a new center, EDISC, Area Digital Innovations and Sustainable Economy Center, was launched at the end of last month from the Economic Research Institute for ASEAN and East Asia area to promote digital in innovations and sustainable economy in the region. With this new center as a focal point, area will greatly expand its scope of activities. The center will strengthen human networks among industry, government, and academia and promote research and studies on decarbonization, data utilizations, and circular economy toward the realizations of Asia Zero Emission Community, ASEC, and energy initiative led by Japan. Once again, Japan and the rest of the world on top of promoting the free trade, um, economic security needs to be ascertained. We have to do the both, pursue both at the same time. The IPEF, which is the framework for cooperation among like-minded countries led by U.S., which also includes India and the CPTPP, which commit to high standards, and the RCEP, which is centered on Japan and establishes roles in a wide range of areas, have different origin, but each is a necessary framework to achieve both economic security and free trade, and it is important to use and develop them to a maximum extent from this perspective. Last but not least, in the highly uncertain future of the world and the Asia-Pacific region, it is important to not on a bilateral basis, but on a limited basis to promote the development of a free trade framework. I would like to emphasize the importance of making the best use of the CPTPP and RCEP as well as the regional efforts centering on the ASEAN regions and promoting economic activities on an interregional basis. 
The more we can help each other within the region, the more friendly we can be to each other. I understand that uh, we have the expert to participate in the panel discussions who have the deep insights. I look forward to a lively discussion in the panel discussion. And this concludes my keynote speech. Thank you.